very warm welcome to Bharata First. You're watching Big Picture with me, Frank Rausen Pereira. First, let me inform you about Bharata First Knowledge Center, an initiative that will help each one of you and transform the way you learn. We have started international relations and art and culture classes, and they've had a phenomenal response. All those who have been a part of the Knowledge Center have had a great time. You too can be a part of this journey. Go to our website, uh, kc.bharatafirst.com for more details and register now. We will offer you the limited period early bird discounts only for a few more days. So take full advantage of it. Bharata First Knowledge Center will change the way you learn. It's like something you've never experienced. Be a part of this incredible journey today. Register now. Since you're here, I would like to thank you for your continued support. For those of you who haven't already subscribed, please like the video, subscribe, hit the bell icon, and then all notifications. Do subscribe to our newsletter to get some incisive content. The Bharata First team runs a daily big picture quiz. Please participate by going through the description in big picture videos. Here are the UPI IDs for those of you who would like to come forward and make a contribution. A small contribution that you make will be a giant leap for us to keep bringing you this content. We are also considering ads and sponsorships. You can reach us at marketing at bharatafirst.com. All this information is in the description of the video. Please go through it. And now on to the discussion. A recent report by the Pew Research Center, a Washington DC based nonpartisan think tank has found that a majority of Indians enjoy religious freedom, value religious tolerance and believe that respect for all religions is central to the idea of India. The Pew study is based on a face-to-face -face survey of around 30,000 Indian adults between late 2019 and early 2020, weeks before the COVID-19 pandemic hit the world. The Pew Research Center study highlights the new demographic projections, which took into account the current size and geographic distribution of the world's major religious uh, religions, I beg your pardon, age differences, fertility and mortality rates, international migration and patterns in conversion. The Pew study also took a closer look at religious identity, nationalism and tolerance in Indian society. According to the Pew survey, people of all six major religious groups, Hindus, Muslims, Christians, Jains, Sikhs, and Buddhists overwhelmingly believe that they are very free to practice their faiths. In this edition of Big Picture, we will analyze the Pew Research Center's survey on religion in India, tolerance, and segregation. Joining me on the program today are Abhinav Prakash of Delhi University, Savio Rodriguez of uh, who is the editor-in-chief of Goa Chronicle, and Monica Varma, who is a PhD in international relations from South Asian University. Uh, thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of Big Picture. Uh, Savio, let me start the program with you first. Uh, what are the key takeaways and what is it that you found interesting as far as uh, uh, the research or the survey on religion in India, tolerance and segregation? Key highlights and key takeaways for you. Well, it was a very interesting survey, Frank. The first most important aspect is that it brought out the fact which a lot of media miss, misses out as far as international media is concerned. And that is the aspect that a Hindu, a Muslim, a Christian, a Sikh, irrespective of a religion, are actually united towards a purpose. And that purpose is the greater good of India. So a lot of times in our uh, media uh, coverage that you see in India and some of it internationally, there is a picture that's painted that deals with the fact that minor issues of, of dissonance between religious uh, communities are blown out of proportion to make people feel that the entire country is actually in a communal turmoil. But that isn't true because when you go at a ground level, most people in India, whether they're Hindus, Muslims, Christians, Sikhs, Parsis, Jains, Buddhists, they actually live together in harmony. I'm not saying that there are no discontentment in certain pockets, but they don't de define India, they don't describe India, and they certainly are not the real picture of India. So what the Pew Research has done is actually shown the world that there is the truth of unity in diversity as far as India is concerned. Absolutely. Um, Abhinav, let me come to you now. You know, yet we see that these stray incidents that Savio is talking about are the ones that are highlighted. Is it because vested interests are at play? Is it because that is what the community wants to consume? 
or what is it really what do we need to pinpoint to uh, you know why does this happen or is it because the international media wants to show us in bad light i think it's uh, several factors the first one is the inability to understand the india because as the survey shows uh, and many discussions on the survey in the western countries is about look at how india indians want segregation how how indians you know don't want to marry with each other how indians uh, want to have dietary uh, restrictions which comes out very clear in the survey because people saying we are happy to live with the other person we have, we respect the other person but we don't want to intermarry and both muslims and hindus and other people have very strict restrictions and taboos about the diet so one thing is the inability to understand india that people can still live in a relative uh, harmony with diversity and respect each other's belief and still follow their own traditions so in the western world view especially the liberal world view that is something which is incomprehensible second thing is as you are right i mean bad news sell so you have to take certain anecdotal evidences paint them a picture a story and then present a picture of india you know that india is going down the fascist way or majoritarian way which is basically trying to impose the western model on india where the dominance of a religious party always leads to a majoritarian or fascist rule but in india that's quite opposite because notions of religion understanding of what religion is is completely different from the western perspective which is more rooted in the abrahamic world view of black and white third point is yes there is a little bit deliberate attempt as well uh, because after the pandemic what is happening the shift of the power from the western world to the west has accelerated it's not just china but india will also rise up in the coming decades and it's very difficult to take any action against a democracy which is secular which is inclusive so just there is an attempt to paint that india is no longer a democracy it has become an electoral autocracy and what not so that 10 years down the line if you want to take any strategic action against india that will have public acceptability in the western country sounds like conspiracy theory but this is what is happening because i i don't see the reason why there is a uniform propaganda against india suddenly in all the western world in the post pandemic world uh, you know as far as uh, the western world is concerned and as far as uh, the western media is concerned let's build on this point a little bit you know uh, what is the crux of the problem really what is it that they want to convey do they want to show india in bad light how do they want to portray india to the rest of the world uh thank you for the question frank i think uh, as someone you know who's a student of interna- not a student anymore as a scholar of international relations i think one thing that needs to be uh, clearly underlined here is that india is rising and that's a fact that no one can deny so you know looking at the geopolitical equations even you know if you look at the geo economic aspect of the situation india is consistently you know trying to be a part of those alliances where we can actually you know see a very possible rise of ourselves as not just as a nation but also you know as a centuries old civilization and whenever a civilizational power is rising in the world it actually leads to a lot, lot of discomfort for the people for you know not just for the people but also for the countries who are currently powerful so you know a new challenger is coming to the international system a new power will be rising and that will consistently you know be changing the very character of how the global order looks like and when this is happening you know you tend to hold on to your own comfort zone and where does the comfort zone of the west lie western world you know for centuries has lived on this false pretext of undermining our cultural heritage of our religious coexistence so they have a problem you know when a country like india is ma- making all the right kind of noises so you know as many factors as possible they'll always point that out to blame that india is not going to be a credible you know power to rise so this is something similar to what happened to china as well so if you look at you know the human rights issue abuse of the laborers in china their industrialization model problem of pollution so many you know detractors of china were literally you know criticizing china on so many points as china was rising and this is something that we've observed in the last two decades so yeah now you know what's happening is that india is trying to become powerful so imagine a democratic india goes to court and talks about you know uh, balancing china it tries to become a part of the clubs that matter internationally how do you put that india down you unpack that india and try to bring the fault lines to fore and what pew research survey has basically done it has proved that all of it is nothing but basically propaganda so you know to begin with it has literally called out the biggest lie of our time that intolerance is rising in india 
if intolerance is rising in india then how come 89% of muslims of the 30000 respondents are saying that they feel safe to practice their religion in india so someone has to you know call them out how is intolerance rising if 89% muslims feel safe to practice their religion here also what's most important is that all the religions you know no matter whether it's a muslim person or a hindu or a sikh or a christian all of them are saying the same thing that we consider indian our identity to be you know we consider uh, our identity to be indian successful only when we are able to respect other religions equally you know so for them the uh, the intrinsic value of being an indian also brings the necessity of respecting other religions all right let me take the points that you are making forward now and let me bring in savio into the picture once again you know this trend of interfaith marriages i think is the same across religions if you look at the numbers very closely it's just not limited to ab- abrahamic uh, religions but religions across the board they do not want interfaith marriages what is the story that it tells that is one and going deeper into the numbers 9% of hindus stay speaking hindi to national identity so there is a strong hindi language national identity that is taking center stage how would you look at these two sets of numbers sabio well uh, frank to be honest if marriages are based on love irrespective of which religion the couples belong to they will end up getting married one way or the other and the court will be the route that these couples would normally opt for but if the marriage is more related to to uh, the religion or to the caste of a person and it's more familiar when i mean familiar more driven by family obligations or family respect then it's going to go exactly the way the family the religion or the caste wants it to go now you cannot put a restriction on love you cannot put a restriction on on the ones wanting to opt the religious or caste way of marriage at the end of the day it's a choice and when you're left with a choice you are allowed to go with that choice but when you come to issues that are of heart to religion for example you know in 2018 uh, i had a run in with the archbishop of uh, delhi that's anil kuto and ali kuto made a statement which said that the christians are in danger in india and i thought that the Christ, that statement or the core essence of that statement was very poor simply because of a few stray incidents that happened between religious communities not only in india but all around the world because if you analyze issues of conflict around the world and i and i can say it with some authority because i did do do a course with our on religion conflict and peace i can tell you that most conflicts around the world originate because of religion and when religion is at the heart of the conflict it gets very difficult to resolve the conflict so conflict is not the absence of peace conflict is the absence of violence and, and you know at a uh, at times where where you want peace so basically when there is no violence there is peace but the conflict does exist that's what what the galping theory was all about the point is this today if we are going to drive india by way, way of religion we're not going to go forward at, at all because sanatan dharma which is really the actual essence of indians is not really a religion it's a belief system it's a way of life it's a scientific way of looking forward so that is why today when i go to to the holy ganga i'm not seeing it as anti christian i'm seeing it as partaking in what is considered to be my cultural roots as far as india is concerned so when a christian tells me you have defiled christianity your family will be cursed i laugh at it because i'm not able to understand what do you mean by it and likewise i get no people from the hindu community say you must do a garbapsi why should i do a garbapsi i am an indian i'm in my own house my religion doesn't define my identity or my my nationalism right and that's where the essential problem is the essential problem is people cannot differentiate between religion and national identity your religion can never be your national identity that's the problem your national identity is you so whether i'm a hindu whether i'm a muslim whether i'm a christian 
What has that got to do with the fact that I'm an Indian? And the problem that's stemming in the country right now, and which is what you've seen for so many years, and which is why the West uses it to the extreme, is the division based on religion. So today, when a small issue of religion is blown out of proportion and it turns communal, it gives enough fodder for the West to actually target India saying, this is a communal country. It actually isn't. Because the principles of Sanatana Dharma do not allow for such kind of division based on religion. It allows for acceptance. Unfortunately, Christianity, Islam tend to, tend to kind of categorize people based on some aspects of their religion or religious belief. That's why today, when issues of love jihad are coming prominently out, where even the church in Kerala has taken up an issue against love jihad, why are they doing that? They are doing that because they are afraid that the conversion of the Christian child is far more eminent if they marry into a Muslim family. So it's, it's a very convoluted problem, but the co solution to the problem does not lie with religion. The solution to the problem lies actually with the uniform civil court, which you know, that, you, you've touched a, you've touched a subject which is a which is a whole new debate in itself, and we can talk about that for a whole hour. So we'll try and keep <laughs> UCC out of this this particular discussion because you know, like I said, it, we can just continue talking till for another couple of hours on that, and you know solution. where we are headed. Yeah, that's a huge huge issue. But yeah, talking about Hindi identity, you know, that's something that I would like to take up with you as well. You know, 59% of Hindus have said have tied speaking Hindi to national identity. Now that Hindi I see, can never be. A, it, it can never be, Frank. Let me tell you why. Because Hindi is not the national language of India, number one. Trying to convert it into a national language of India is unfair to the other languages of the country. If you have to unite the country, then the legitimate language is Sanskrit. Because Sanskrit is the language that actually binds all the communities together by source of the, uh, the dialects and the other languages as far as the country is concerned. So Hindi, even I would oppose it. I would oppose Hindi being put on, on all other states, especially the south, southern states, simply because Hindi is not the origin of the languages as far as this country is concerned. Right. Abhinav, let me bring you into the picture now. Um, Caste story isn't too good as well. That too needs a little bit of a special attention. Apart from that, 64% of Hindus say that it is very important to be Hindu to be truly Indian. Now that is very contradictory to what Savio has just said as well. So that too I see as an issue because, you know, Hinduism is not a religion. It's a way of life. Well, uh, there are two things. First of all, uh, when it comes to the caste, the numbers are actually pretty good because the 82% Indians are saying that they, didn't, they did not face any caste discrimination in the one year prior to the survey, which is a huge number. The majority of uh, scheduled caste and scheduled tribe people interviewed also say, and majority means around 70-80% people are saying that they do not face any widespread discrimination. So that shows that lots of things have changed on the ground in the past uh, several decades and things have become much, much better. Of course, when it comes to marriage, people are not willing to marry across the caste, which is very similar to what you see in the religious case. So I think that that is a very strong adherence to your community. It does not necessarily translate into, uh, let's say, ill will or uh, towards the other community, uh, which is fine. I mean, the marriages are very personal decisions. We can't force people to marry across caste, across religion to prove that they are not discriminatory. What I'm, I will be concerned with is their behavior in the public sphere, not in their private life. The second part you're talking about uh, is uh, religion, right? The, to be an Indian is necessary to be a Hindu. See how the, uh, and it brings to the entire idea of the religion because this survey also says that around 60% of the people in India believe that religion is not just about the set of belief, it's also about your ancestry. So you can see it's, it's, it's similar numbers across Hindus and the Muslims. The religion is also about your ancestry, where you're born, what is the tradition. It's not just about the set of beliefs. Because having a set of belief, a universal set of belief is again, as uh, my co-panelists have talked about, is 
more of a Christian or an Islamic, just to say Abrahamic worldview that is an abstract belief you subscribe to. Whereas in India, the religion is more about tradition. It's not about a truth which has been revealed to you that you have to follow the truth. It's about discovering that truth in your own individual journey. So people do not really see a distinction between being Hindu and being Indian because they relate the two with their ancestry. So I think these numbers are coming from uh, that kind of belief because the mass beliefs are always, uh, let's say, uh, dispersed. So the, you look at the Muslim numbers as well. A large number of Muslim, I think 30% of Muslim believe in karma. 37% uh, 30, of Muslim believe that uh, God can have more than one manifestation, which are contrary to the pure Islamic uh, beliefs, right? But this is how people are at the mass level. Their beliefs are not black and white. They have diverse heterodox views. So here also we're seeing the same kind of number that also goes for the Hindi language thing. Majority of the people in central India who are Hindi speaker believe that Hindi is the natural Indian language and this is what India is all about. Not necessarily they're going to put down or impose Hindi on the other people, but this is how they believe in their own limited circle. Uh, coming to uh, the other point, which uh, Monica also talked about, is about secularism. I agree, the secularism does not work in an Indian context. Secularism works in a homogeneous religious society, let's say the Western Europe, where you have the Christian population and there are different sects of Christianity, each claiming themselves to be the true. So the state say, well, I'm going to be neutral, you people fight it out. You can't do that in India because there are different religions in India. It's not homogeneous religious community. The moment you have secularism, you are keeping religions on different pedestals. Like Islam believes in mass conversion. A tribal uh, uh, tradition in Northeast or in Central India does not believe in mass conversion, right? So you are not creating an equal ground. You are creating an unequal ground. You are allowing multinational uh, churches to go and convert the, uh, the tribals who, who are very limited localized belief systems. The secularism has proved to be quite destructive for India in the last seven decades, I would say, because it's not suited to Indian reality. As the survey says that India is secular or uh, diverse, not because of secularism in the constitution, but because how the society see the religion and the belief system. And throughout the ages for the millennia, India has remained like that, you know, different religions living together because state was not secular. Let's be very clear about it. There is no word for secularism in any Indian language, not at all. Absolutely. All right, so Monica, coming back to you now, you know, let's, uh, we were talking about intolerance and propaganda and how the West looks at India very differently. How do we change that? Uh, where, who, whose, uh, you know, prerogative is it to change that? Is it the governments? Is it the, is it the medias? I mean, who gets to do that? Or who should do it? I think Frank is saying that until unless, you know, the lion learns to write, every story will glorify the hunter. So I think in our case, as a post-colonial country, it's a truth that we started from a very, very unfair ground. Unlike the West, which had, you know, advantage in terms of their industrialization taking off at a very uh, early age, and they utilizing our resources to become industrialized. And even, you know, at every other platform, whether it's the international media or the social media, or, you know, uh, the d d different other, you know, aspects of communication, Western media definitely holds a lot of power when it comes to, Western media definitely holds a lot of power when it comes to, you know, uh, how propaganda is created. So I do not think it's going to be an equal, uh, a level playing field, so to say, a uh, thing that we need to recognize. And that I'm talking with, you know, a sense of experience with my own uh, background experience in media as a journalist is that, you know, you have to incentivize it. So, you know, all these countries uh, which own these media outlets are basically incentivizing a certain kind of conversations related to India. So, you know, when India goes and tries to negotiate about trade deals or at various regional and multilateral forums, at the same time, you know, a sort of propaganda is also created around India. And that propaganda is related to how India is not a very trustworthy actor, how the Indian state is very questionable. So, you know, they try and always limit India to a, a very, very, you know, domestic sphere of influence. They do not want India to be on offensive ever, which is why so many allegations are always leveled at India. Our energy is spent in defending ourselves all the time. So, you know, we have to live up to their uh, definition of democracy. We have to live up to their definition of secularism. 
we have to live up to their definition of multicultural world so we are always you know doing the defending uh, the defensive work on the other hand states such as china states such as vietnam uh, vietnam i am taking example because there is another related debate you know which has been quite popular on social media these days related to the use of english so i think when it comes to uh, these countries which are quite strong and they do not believe in defending or having a sense of inferiority complex these states are much better placed in the global hierarchy so, so one second to, yeah one second okay let me get quick closing comments now from all my panelists with the best way forward and what needs to be done in the near future starting first with you savio well i've been lived in the middle east for a long time and in india for an equally num- longer time i've realized one thing and and this is what has always helped me that i don't look at people on in through the prisms of religion so i have been to a mosque i've been to a darga i've been to a hindu temple i go to a church i will go to a buddhist monk as well because i see them as places of worship i see them as a respect that i have for my fellow friends and their beliefs i think the most important aspect of tolerance is being able to understand that there is no one way to god because if god you have to actually find god and understand religion in context of living it is about finding god in yourself and finding god around you that's really what sanatan dharma is all about the problem is when we get uh, you know bottled or dogmatized into thinking that this is the path to god is when we are actually getting confused and that confusion then percolates to our day to day living which then becomes our social living our community living and sometimes our nation living as well so the most important aspect for us to understand what tolerance is is humanity we are all at the end of the day human strippers of the baggages that we have from religion and you would realize that abina could very well have been savio born in 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 uh, mumbai to a christian family and i could have been abina born in his to his family what would have changed us our thought process gets convoluted based on the the kind of company we keep or the doctrination that we take in the end we are all humans and humanity is above all humanity to me is is being god so once india walks that path of sanatan dharma which is really what sanatan dharma is all about it's not about being hindu it's not about being you know having a language that connects us called hindi it's about being human and that is what india is and will be the beacon of as we go ahead because when you see the world around conflict every conflict is between christianity and islam or it will be between islam and buddhism or it will be between islam and hinduism right in the end it is sanatan dharma you want to call it hinduism fine with me but sanatan dharma is the beacon that will unite people in the world in the future couldn't have been said better thank you savio abhinav so i think what this survey has shown us is a complete detachment between the reality and what we read in newspapers what we study in the universities the social sciences in india have no empirical basis they're all ideological shadow warfare so perhaps we need to invest a lot more in empirical studies and then base our theories based on those empirical numbers and data set instead of just copying whatever is being produced in the american universities because as of now the social science in india is completely dominated by the american university and their social constructs which i think is a very very destructive thing even france is not pushing back china has already rejected it most of the islamic world has rejected what the american social science is is high time that india should also do the same all right and monica close the show for us with a quick concluding remark um so i'll just add to what abhinav ji said regarding social sciences you know it's a huge problem we do not have our own empirical data and which is why we don't have our own theory so you know you cannot combat a propaganda until unless you have truth on your side so it's high time you know state takes that uh, thing very seriously why we need a pure research survey to conduct you know research on religion in india for us why can't we why can't why can't the indian government or maybe the private sector agencies commission these kind of research and just you know burst their propaganda and nip the bird right there also you know just to just to add a little i think as someone who has a background in media as well i think it's high time we start taking our uh, media function also really seriously we do not have a single channel that represents indian voice on the global platform we've been talking about dd international from such a long time 
until unless so it's right about agenda setting okay if we if we won't ask questions if we won't ask the right questions and lay down the agenda from the very beginning then these kind of stories from india will come to haunt us and the sorry uh, state of affairs is that even in india to know about india we are dependent on the international news agencies so what we need to do is that we need to have our own wire agencies we need to have our own tv channels our own social media platforms only then you know our stories will start coming out the true story will uh, start emerging from india and the world will finally know what actually india is like so i think that's my concluding remark all right We'll have to leave it at that. Thank you so much to all my guests for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us. Well, what's coming out of this discussion is that apart from a few stray incidents, uh, there is no intolerance in India. This is nothing but propaganda of the West and certain institutions. Those who talk of intolerance need to look at their own backyard first. The survey has uh, busted many myths about India and its people. The problem right now is that there isn't anyone to tell our side of the story. Even our education system is convoluted and doesn't convey what it needs to. That is what we need to change. Before I go, let me once again inform you about Bharata First Knowledge Center, an initiative that will help each one of you and transform the way you learn. We have started international relations and Indian art and culture classes, and they've had a phenomenal response. All those who have been part of the Knowledge Center have had a great time. You too can be a part of this journey. Go to our website, kc.bharatafirst.com for more details and register now. Uh, we will offer you the limited period early bird discounts only for a few more days. Bharata First Knowledge Center will change the way you learn. It's like something you've never experienced. Be a part of this incredible journey today. Register now. Since you're here, I would like to thank you for your continued support. For those of you who haven't already subscribed, please uh, like the video, subscribe, hit the bell icon, and then all notifications. Do subscribe to our newsletter to get some incisive content as well. The Bharata First team runs a daily big picture quiz. Please participate by going through the description in big picture videos. Here are the UPI IDs for those of you who would like to come forward and contribute. A small contribution that you make will be a giant leap for us to keep bringing you this content. We are also considering ads and sponsorships. You can reach us at marketing at bharatafas.com. All this information is in the description of the video along with some must see recommendations. So please go through it. That's it from me. See you again next time. Thank <music> you.